Houston, ETM Bill Door closure and work. We copy and we're watching Discovery. We copy, we have no deltas. This is Mission Control Houston. The external tank umbilical uh, well doors on the orbiter have now been closed and latched. All that went very well. As we uh, count down uh, toward the firing of the orbital maneuvering system engines, 13 and a half minutes from now in a uh, orbital refinement uh, maneuver uh, that will place discovery. That will place discovery uh, in yet a better orbit, not as highly elliptical as when it uh, reached orbit at main engine cutoff as it uh, continues its uh, chase to catch up to the International Space Station on Thursday. We'll uh, return now to the Kennedy Space Center for a series of launch replays, continuing commentary on the mission audio circuits. Uh, we now will go back to the Kennedy Space Center for launch replays from Discovery's liftoff that occurred just 25 minutes ago.
This is Mission Control Houston as you watch the replays of today's launch of Discovery from the Kennedy Space Center. We are less than nine minutes away from the firing of the orbital maneuvering system engines and an orbit refinement burn known as the OMS-2 burn. This uh, will place uh, Discovery in a less elliptical orbit as it begins its rendezvous profile en route to the International Space Station and a docking on Thursday morning. Discovery systems in good shape. Flight controllers here not working any issues as they are in the post-insertion checklist. We're going to be handed over to uh, Z in about five minutes. It'll be about uh, two and a half minutes before the burn. Uh, the burn will be on Z. And I have just a few words on the left ohms tank P when you're ready. Uh, ready to copy on the left ohms tank P. At Discovery, uh, the short version is it is no concern. Uh, what it was uh, during the purge on the left ohms engine uh, post assist, uh, the purge flow of N2 just drew the accumulator down just slightly below the lower limit uh, for FTA. So you got a message as soon as the purge ended, it immediately recovered. Uh, this is something they've seen before. It is not a concern, uh, though you may see it again on subsequent burns. There's no way to predict, but uh, I would not worry about it. Okay, we, co we copy all that, that the purge drew it down, and it's no concern for the burn. And Houston Discover, I don't know if you're getting this, we're getting a lot of noise on UHF right now. Uh, Discover Houston, uh, thanks for the heads up, Steve. We are not receiving that on the ground. So I think, uh, I think probably at least for the burn, we're going to take UHF off for now. Uh, Discover Houston, uh, you can uh, take off air to air and leave it off. We have no further need for it. Okay, we've got that off.
This is Mission Control Houston continuing to watch uh, replays of Discovery's launch from the Kennedy Space Center that occurred 36 minutes ago at 1.38 p.m. Central Time. We are standing by uh, less than two minutes from now for the firing of the orbital maneuvering systems engines on Discovery that will uh, further refine its orbit and continue its pursuit of the International Space Station. Discovery is currently orbiting at an altitude of 143 statute miles by 35 statute miles over eastern Africa. Uh, Discovery Houston, uh, could you confirm the left flight controller power is on? Thank you, Steve. Flight controller power is on. Discovery Houston, we show a good config for the burn. Spacecraft Communicator Steve Frick reporting back to Commander Steve Lindsay that everything looks good for the burn of the orbital maneuvering system engines coming up in about 45 seconds. This will be a firing of both orbital maneuvering system engines, the big engine rockets at the back uh, of the shuttle itself, for one minute, five seconds. Again, Discovery about to cross the equator, moving from northwest to southeast. Passing out now over the Indian Ocean, while the International Space Station is tracking up the eastern seaboard of the United States. The propulsion officer in mission control reports that the orbital maneuvering system engines are burning. Good burn, good control, according to the guidance navigation and control officer. Discover Houston, we show a good burn, no trim is required. Okay. And uh, as you heard, uh, Steve Frick, uh, the spacecraft communicator here in the shuttle flight control room, reporting back uh, that we had a good firing of the orbital maneuvering system engines. Again, the crew now in its uh, post-insertion checklist following uh, Discovery's launch from the Kennedy Space Center, setting up uh, equipment and preparing uh, for the opening of the payload bay doors. The payload bay door opening expected about 45 minutes from now.
And Houston Discovery, we're going to the post insertion book. We copy and concur. Uh, we have no deltas to uh, block one, just to give you a heads up. Uh, however, on page 1-5, when you get there, we're going to have a different payload bay door opening attitude. Uh, just give me a call whenever you're ready to copy. Okay. This is Mission Control Houston, 45 minutes into Discovery's flight. The shuttle and its seven astronauts now setting up shop on what will be their orbital home for the next uh, 12 to 13 days. Discovery currently flying over the Indian Ocean just off the northeast coast of the island of Madagascar. Traveling at an altitude now following the orbital maneuvering system burn of 143 statute miles by 97 statute miles. Additional rendezvous maneuvers on tap over the course of the next uh, 36 hours or so that will lead Discovery to a docking with the International Space Station on Thursday morning just before 10 a.m. Central Time.
in Houston, Discovery. Uh, circuit breakers are done. We're going to block one. We copy. Thanks for the tag up, Steve. We're ready for block one. No deltas. And it'll be dual G2, as I'm sure you expect. Discovery, Houston, back with you after the handover. Steve, we do like your MBAT, and we see Ops 106. Copy. This is Mission Control Houston, 52 minutes into the flight of Discovery. On the STS-121 mission, the 32nd flight of Discovery, the 115th mission in shuttle program history. Here in the space, space Shuttle Flight Control Room, nearly an hour following the launch of the orbiter and its seven astronauts, everything uh, continues to go very smoothly in the post-insertion timeline with Discovery currently flying uh, over the southern Indian Ocean, about to begin a swing uh, just past uh, southern Australia, orbiting at an altitude of 144 by 96 statute miles, all of its systems in excellent shape. Discovery's launch uh, was flawless from the Kennedy Space Center. No systems issues associated with the launch, everything in good shape. Uh, back down at the Kennedy Space Center about 30 minutes from now, the post-launch news conference will be held. Discovery Houston, that's affirmed. Steve, dual G2. Copy, dual G2. Uh, uh, Discovery Houston, uh, Steve, regarding step four, stand by one second. We're checking the update for dual versus single. The question is uh, regarding NC1 later. Uh, just give us one minute.
And Houston Discovery, if you're happy with this end, that will go over to uh, Ops 201. Uh, Discovery Houston, uh, Steve, hold one before you uh, do the off mode recall. We're uh, looking at the uh, NBAT again. Uh, we think that NC1 is going to be waved off today, so we're checking to see if we want to go straight to G1. We apologize for the late notice. Uh, no problem. Discovery Houston for step four of block one. Uh, we will take single G2. Uh, we apologize for the late chain change, and uh, NC1 will not be required today, and we'll have those deltas for the flight plan for you when we get done with post-insertion. Okay, copy that. So in uh, step four, we're going to go to single G2. Good read back. Here on the Space Shuttle Flight Control Room, Spacecraft Communicator Steve Frick, uh, second uh, from your left as you look at... Uh, the front row at the flight director's console. Uh, Frick uh, telling Commander Steve Lindsay that the so-called NC-1 burn, a course correction burn, will not be required today, part of the rendezvous uh, maneuver package that will lead Discovery to its docking to the International Space Station. Uh, that docking is currently scheduled for 9.52 a.m. Central Time on Thursday. At the moment, uh, the space shuttle and its seven astronauts traveling over the southern Indian Ocean about to begin a swing uh, just uh, to the south of the continent of Australia, while the International Space Station uh, is traveling uh, over Europe, southern Europe, uh, both uh, craft on a northwest to southeasterly track orbiting at different altitudes at the moment, but they will be synced up come Thursday morning for Discovery's docking to the complex. Here in the uh, Space Shuttle Flight Control Room, uh, the flight director who presided over his first ascent uh, about an hour ago, Steve Stitch, remains on console. Stitch, uh, along with Flight Director Norm Knight, uh, Knight on the far right of your screen, uh, Stitch to his right, second uh, from the right as you view uh, uh, the console here in Mission Control. Knight uh, was uh, the flight director in charge of all of the weather discussions over the Space Flight Meteorology Group. Uh, finally, uh, offering Steve Stitch uh, his recommendation that we were go for weather for return to launch site abort uh, weather parameters that uh, was passed on to the chair of the mission management team, John Shannon. Uh, down at the Kennedy Space Center, about 30 minutes from now at the top of the hour at uh, 3 p.m. Central Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time will be the post-launch news conference. Uh, that will include uh, the NASA Administrator, Michael Griffin, Bill Gerstenmeyer, the NASA Associate Administrator for Space Operations, Wayne Hale, the Space Shuttle Program Manager, John Shannon, the Deputy Shuttle Program Manager and the Chair of the Mission Management Team, and Mike Leinbach, the NASA Launch Director. Again, the post-launch news conference coming up at the top of the hour at 3 p.m. Central Time, 4 Eastern Time, featuring NASA Administrator Michael Griffin, Bill Gerstenmeyer, the NASA Associate, Associate Administrator for Space Operations, Space Shuttle Program Manager Wayne Hale, John Shannon, the Deputy Shuttle Program Manager and the Chair of the Mission Management Team for this flight, and Mike Leinbach, NASA's Launch Director. Again, that's the post-launch news conference coming up at the top of the hour. Down the hall from the Space Shuttle Flight Control Room in the International Space Station Flight Control Room, another team of flight controllers has been on console throughout the day as they are 365 days a year. Uh, Steve, we don't have any insight with this uh this uh, down list, so you can press on. Copy. The uh, space station flight control team that's on console at this hour is uh, directed by Flight Director John Curry. Uh, they were on console at the time of Discovery's launch. Curry on the right side of your screen, joined uh, by spacecraft communicator Mike Jensen on the left in the red shirt. Jensen uh, has been discussing activities today with Expedition 13 Commander Pavel Vinogradov and NASA Flight Engineer and Science Officer Jeff Williams. Vinogradov and Williams currently in their 97th day in space since their launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan back on March 30th on a Soyuz TMA-8 spacecraft. 
They docked to the International Space Station on April 1st to begin their six months on the complex. At the time of Discovery's launch, exactly one hour ago, the International Space Station was passing uh, just over the island of Tasmania, south of Australia, orbiting at an altitude of 220 statute miles. Jeff Williams uh, was able to view the launch of Discovery through a video uplink. There was a KU band communications uh, pass at that time, and Williams and his commander, Pavel Vinogradov, watched the launch of Discovery, as you see in this replay of the video at the time of launch that took place at 1.38 p.m. Central Time just one hour ago. This was an off-duty day for Williams and Vinogradov as they completed preparations for the arrival of Discovery's crew. They will be hosting Discovery's astronauts uh, for at least eight days, perhaps nine, assuming a mission extension since we launched on today's opportunity. The uh, final decision on extending the mission to an extra day, a 13th day for Discovery and an extra day docked to the International Space Station will be made a few days from now by the mission management team. Williams and uh, Vinogradov also are eagerly expecting the arrival of European Space Agency astronaut Tomas Ryder, who now in his second flight into space will be, uh, be will become part of the space station crew just a few hours after docking on Thursday. Following the opening of the hatches between the shuttle and the station, Ryder uh, will begin work along with Vinogradov to move his custom-made Soyuz seat liner over from uh, the shuttle to the station, and at that point he will officially become a member of the Expedition 13 crew, and that will mark the return uh, of the International Space Station to a three-person crew for the first time since May of 2003, when the Expedition 6 crew, Ken Bowersox, Nikolai Budarin, and Don Pettit, departed from the complex. Again, this uh, was a video replay of Williams and Vinogradov watching the launch of Discovery aboard the International Space Station just one hour ago. Uh, just a few minutes after Discovery's launch, uh, Williams uh, discussed uh, his impressions of the launch with flight controllers in the International Space Station flight control room. And hey, uh, pass uh, on our congratulations to the launch team and uh, everybody that uh, had a part in preparing Discovery and it, her crew to uh, to get off the pad this morning. Congratulations to everybody. Makes a great uh, Independence Day. And Jeff, I uh, could not possibly agree with you more. And uh, I hope uh, you and uh, Pavel are getting ready for a, a whole bunch of house guests and a new housemate. We're very ready. Uh, we'll put the leaf in the table and be ready for a, for a crowd uh, at the meal in a couple of days here. Copy all, Jeff, uh, and we'll uh, talk to you on the other side. We're going to leave the uh, KU up uh, the whole pass. Once again, that was a, a replay of a brief conversation uh, a short time ago between NASA flight engineer Jeff Williams of the Expedition 13 crew aboard the International Space Station and station spacecraft communicator Mike Jensen in the International Space Station flight control room down the hall from the shuttle flight control room here in Mission Control. Williams and Vinogradov now just two days away from having uh, their crew expanded to a three-man crew once uh, Tomas Ryder of the European Space Agency arrives on board to begin a half year on the International Space Station, Ryder is scheduled to return to Earth uh, in six months on the uh, 
shuttle Discovery on the STS-116 mission that will deliver American astronaut Sonny Williams to the station as part of the Expedition 14 and then 15 crew. Meanwhile, back here in the shuttle flight control room, uh, the Ascent team of flight controllers continuing uh, to monitor the work of Discovery's astronauts. Houston, Discovery blocks two and three are, are both in work, by the way. We copy. Thanks for the tag-up. Discovery's astronauts working their way through the post-insertion checklist, uh, setting up shop, uh, configuring computer systems, and preparing uh, for the opening of the payload bay doors that is expected about 20 minutes or so from now. Once uh, the doors are open, uh, the flash evaporator system that was activated during ascent providing cooling for the shuttle's avionics can be deactivated. It uh, will not be uh, required anymore uh, to cool off uh, the orbiter systems uh, during its uh, time in space until uh, the point at which uh, the payload bay doors are closed uh, for Discovery's landing almost two weeks from now back at the Kennedy Space Center. And once again, uh, coming up at the top of the hour on NASA television, we'll be back at the Kennedy Space Center for the post-launch news conference featuring NASA Administrator Michael Griffin, Bill Gerstenmeyer, NASA's Associate Administrator for Space Operations, Wayne Hale, the Space Shuttle Program Manager, John Shannon, the Deputy Shuttle Program Manager and the Chair of the Mission Management Team, and Mike Leinbach, the NASA Launch Director at the Kennedy Space Center. That post-launch news conference scheduled to begin around the top of the hour at 3 p.m. Central Time, 4 Eastern Time on NASA television. Send discovery until block one complete and uh, block two. At Discovery Houston, uh, sounds like you were clipped, Steve, but we copy block one complete. We copy and concur. Nice job. And block two is complete. Copy. Block two complete.
In Houston Discovery, did you have a delta for the payload bay door at opening attitude? That's a firm. I have the new attitude when you're ready to copy, and this is just to set up for better stars of opportunity. Uh, ready to copy, Steve. The uh, new attitude is a target ID 2, body vector 3, pitch of 90, yaw of 0, and an Omicron of 90. Okay, target ID 2, body vector 3. Uh, pitch of 90, yaw of 0, Omicron of 90. That's a good read, Beck. This is Mission Control Houston. That uh, discussion between spacecraft communicator Steve Frick and uh, the crew on board, uh, Discovery, led by Commander Steve Lindsay, referring to the uh, maneuvering of Discovery to the proper orientation to support the opening of the clamshell-like payload bay doors that's scheduled to begin about 15 to 20 minutes from now. Once uh, the doors are opened, uh, the main payload uh, near the rear of the cargo bay, the Leonardo Multipurpose Logistics Module, the huge cargo module carrying more than two tons of equipment to the International Space Station will be exposed to the environment of space for the first time. Houston Discovery Block 7 can work.
This is Mission Control Houston. Here in the uh, flight control room, the uh, instrumentation and communications officer uh, has reported uh, to Flight Director Steve Stitch that uh, we are going to be activating the external tank umbilical well camera aboard Discovery so that the imagery that was collected of uh, Discovery's external tank as it uh, was jettisoned following uh, our preliminary insertion into orbit, all of that imagery uh, can be downlinked about uh, three and a half hours into the flight. Also, we are uh, activating television systems on board Discovery in the hope uh, to be able to collect some uh, downlink television uh, over a Houston uh, Johnson Space Center uh, antenna that would uh, provide us uh, imagery of the opening of Discovery's payload bay doors expected about uh, 17 minutes from now. Have you loud and clear on handheld. We copy all. Thanks for the tag up. We copy, thank you. This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, more launch replays now being provided through engineering cameras at the Kennedy Space Center while we await uh, discovery passing uh, within range of a uh, local ground station here at the Johnson Space Center that may provide us an opportunity to see the opening of the payload bay doors on the orbiter. Discovery launched from the Kennedy Space Center one hour, 19 minutes ago. A smooth and seamless ride to orbit for Commander Steve Lindsay and his six crewmates. The crew has been uh, working its way effortlessly through uh, the post-insertion checklist, uh, setting up all their computers and all of their equipment on board. Once the payload bay doors are open and confirmed that all other systems are in good shape, ASEN Flight Director Steve Stitch will pull the room here in Mission Control to get a go for on-orbit operations. At that point, the crew will climb out of its launch and entry suits and begin to, to work its way through other activities that are on tap for today, setting up uh, other computers, preparing uh, for the downlink of uh, all of the imagery, both uh, that collected by the 
cameras in the umbilical well of the orbiter as well as the uh, imagery of the external tank that was collected by Mike Fossum and Stephanie Wilson using a PD-100 camcorder and a uh, digital camera, a still camera equipped with a 400 millimeter lens as Discovery was at a distance of about 1,450 feet away from the external tank following its uh, jettisoning uh, from the orbiter. Currently, uh, Discovery is uh, heading towards the equator, moving from southwest to northeast, orbiting at an altitude of 143 by 97 statute miles in pursuit of the International Space Station that's currently orbiting over the southern Indian Ocean. We are expecting uh, to go to the Kennedy Space Center shortly for the post-launch news conference that will feature NASA Administrator Michael Griffin, Bill Gerstenmeyer, the NASA Associate Administrator for Space Operations, Wayne Hale, the Shuttle Program Manager, John Shannon, the Deputy Shuttle Program Manager and Chair of the Mission Management Team, and Mike Leinbach, NASA's Launch Director. Again, that post-launch news conference will be coming up soon from the Kennedy Space Center. T minus 17 seconds and counting. 15, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, go for main engine start, main engine start, 2, 1, booster ignition and liftoff of the space shuttle Discovery returning to the space station paving the way for future missions beyond. Wow. Wow. I, welcome to the uh, STS-121 post-launch press briefing. I can't think of a better way to start this press briefing and to celebrate the 4th of July. Welcome, everybody. We're excited to be here. Let's go through our participants today. To my left is NASA Administrator Michael Griffin. To his left, William Gerstemeyer, Space Operation Mission Director and Associate Administrator. To his left, Wayne Hale, Space Shuttle Program Manager. To his left, we have John Shannon, Deputy Space Shuttle Program Manager and Mission Management Team Chair. And to his left, Mike Leinbach, Space Shuttle Launch Director. We want to thank everybody for joining us on this holiday and uh, ask that we go through just a few things. After some brief opening remarks, ask that uh, we'll go through some question and answers. Identify yourselves. Please turn off your cell phones, not to interrupt anybody else's questions. And ask that if you have questions, please ask them during this time period. We ask that you respect no gaggle at the end because we need to get our gentlemen off, 
or I guess they're not gentlemen, but our folks off to, uh, <laughs> to their day job. <laughs> That was the administrator's line. I can't use that. Take credit for it. All right. Uh, we'll start off with opening remarks from the administrator. Well, I'll be brief. We want to give you time for your questions. Um, some of you have lived with NASA through some of the worst days we can have, and uh, today you had a chance to live through one of the better ones that we can have. In fact, they don't get much better than this, and we're pretty happy. So uh, thanks. All right. Again, I, I just echo it was a great day. Um, you see the uh, the fruits of labor of a lot of folks that went in today. Uh, you, you look at all that hardware that had to work, that had to come together from folks around the country, the team that put that together, the people that worked yesterday to, to work some last-minute things. Uh, just the amount of effort, uh, the dedication of the team is just awesome. We still have a lot of work in front of us. Upcoming, but again, what a great way to start this mission off and what a great tribute today, 4th of July, to all those folks that put in so many hours and put in so much dedication to this wonderful machine. Well, I'm going to start off by saying, no, we did not plan to launch on the 4th of July, but it sure did work out to be great to launch on Independence Day. Great nations dare great things and take risks along the way, and I can think of no better way to explore the space frontier than the way we set out today. Um, I'm going to be brief. I'll be back later with you this evening. I think it's going to be 7.30, and we're going to talk about uh, what the video folks have found between now and then. And um, John? They said never follow you in a speech, Wayne, and, and I know why. The, um, we, uh, we had a great day, and that was pretty obvious by the, uh, by the results. Um, the mission management team had just about zero things to work throughout the entire count. Uh, we showed up today with an eye on the weather, and uh, it cooperated, thankfully. Um, we took a look at the, uh, the area that we had lost a little bit of foam uh, pre-launch, and the uh, predictions uh, for any ice or frost formation there were right on the money, and, and we were in great shape there. And uh, then we just watched uh, Mike Leinbach's team do what they do best, and uh, it, was, it was really exciting. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, it's really my pleasure to represent the launch team in a press conference like this to celebrate Discovery's launch. We worked hardly anything in the launch countdown. It was just a beautiful count. Uh, we work a heck of a lot more problems in our practice counts than we did today. It was just beautiful. The weather came together. I was in contact with the ascent entry flight director, Steve Stitch, throughout the morning, and uh, his weather came together for RTLS, and it was just a beautiful day to watch Discovery launch on July 4th and see it go for so far and see separation and see the boosters tumbling back to Earth. It was just a great day. I'm, I'm really proud to be part of this team. All right, that'll conclude opening remarks. Let's go to some questions. Please identify yourself and identify who uh, you're uh, giving the question to. Let's start off along the uh, wall right there with Mike Cabbage. Mike Cabbage with the Orlando Sentinel for whoever would like to field it. Um, it appears from the camera view from the external tank that, uh, that we all saw during liftoff that about 45 seconds or so after uh, SRB SEP that there were some pieces of debris of some sort that came off the external tank. Um, based on your quick look at it so far and whatever information you've had a chance to, to look at, what's your, your first take on what, what might have happened? Okay. Well, about uh, two minutes and 47 seconds, give or take. Um, we saw three, perhaps four pieces uh, come off. Um, could be an ice frost ramp, could be something else. Um, we also saw another uh, piece or two come off about four minutes and 50 seconds. Uh, both of those are interesting because they are after the time that we're concerned about aerodynamic transport uh, causing damage to the uh, shuttle tiles. Um, that is the very raw preliminary data. As I said, I want to come back in a couple of hours with a little bit more information for you. Um, the uh, imagery team was hard at work when we left them reviewing the, the uh, not only the uh, ET camera footage that you all saw, but also uh, all the high-definition TV camera uh, from the ground cameras all around uh, the center. Hopefully, uh, we will get the uh, ET umbilical well camera uh, pictures, which the crew took and which were taken automatically uh, down before uh, I come back here in a couple of three hours. All right, next question. We'll stay along the, uh, the wall. Go to Tracy Watson. Tracy Watson, USA Today, I guess again for Mr. Hale. Did you see anything uh, in your first look? Did you see anything hit the orbiter, and did you lose any more foam off that little site on the LOX feed line strut? You know, I, I, I think I told you about all we know right now, and uh, 
the report that I asked, first of all, was did we see anything in first stage or early on when we're worried about the aerodynamic transport, and the very early word was no. But I've got to caution you again, the, the folks will take some time to look through all this data, and uh, it will be a while before we get a complete picture of uh, what happened during the ascent when we're looking for these very small events uh, that, that were going on. All right, stay along the wall, and we'll go with Todd. Uh, Todd Halverson of Florida Today, I guess for Wayne. Um, we were looking frame by frame at the uh, video, and it, and it appeared as if uh, some of that foam down near the ice frost ramps was actually flapping in the wind on the way uphill. And I'm wondering if, A, you, that would raise concern if, for the potential for uh, foam coming off at a more critical time during flight, and, and B, whether that foam looked to be of the size that might um, – damage uh, a heat shield? Well, you know, well, okay, I'll put it, put it very simply for you. We, we are beginning the analysis. We're going to do a thorough engineering analysis. I don't have anything more for you right now. Sorry. Um, and, and we will do our usual thorough job, and it will take a little while. But there is not a great deal of pressure. I, I'm sorry these guys have a have a lot of film to review, and it will probably take a couple of three days before we get the whole story together. And again, I think I would add that this isn't too off normal from what I've been trying to describe to you in several press conferences before. You know, we fully expected to lose some foam along the ice frost ramp areas. And remember, if you can remember back when I told you before, I thought it would be very interesting if we knew when that foam came off because that could pinpoint us back to the failure mechanism underlying the foam loss, which will help us make a better design. So I think we've got two awesome pieces of data here uh, from an engineering standpoint that's going to help us take the information we've got, put it back in our theories, and really learn what's going on with foam. So there's, there's two ways of looking at this, and I think it's too early for all of us to, to jump into this right now and start speculating. Let the, the good folks take a look at the video. Let them look at the images. We'll get some of the ET stuff back when Wayne can describe a lot of that to you in the future. But I would not discount this as off nominal. This is kind of what we expected. And, in fact, it's good that we captured this in the video just like we expected so we can, again, use it for benefit in engineering analysis. Uh, and I'll, I'll just put one more, and then probably we won't take any more debris questions, but I'll add one more thing. Is that it happened after, uh, you know, what we saw happened after the time that we are concerned about debris coming off. And that is really good news. Because that is uh, that says that a lot of the things that we could only see at the end of S and at the time that we separated the tank, we didn't know when it occurred, and we always thought that if you lose little pieces of foam late, um, that would be probably the best news that we could get out of this flight. So um, what we've seen is very encouraging, but we are way too early. And like I said, no more debris questions. We'll come back and talk to you in a little bit. I want to add a comment that uh, what you're seeing and what you're having a nearly unique opportunity to see is engineers at work solving a problem in the midst of the problem and watching, having an opportunity to watch how it is that we work, what we do and how we go about solving our problems in, in the face of unknown unknowns, and how we go about gathering data and how we go about reducing those unknown, unknown unknowns into things that we can handle. Um, we're as impatient to get the data as you are to see it, and when we have it, we'll share it with you, as we've promised many times. But this is what it looks like when we're trying to solve a problem uh, that at some point we didn't really even know we had. All right, let's stay right there in front with Mark. Uh, Mark Carroll from the Houston Chronicle. Could you just go over the significance of the timing again, where, where the point is where it's not a concern and, and why I think it has to do with not – the material not stalling in the air, but if you could just give a little explanation of, of that, please. You know, it, as we go up uh, in the atmosphere, it's, it's pretty simple. The, the air pressure gets a lot less. It goes uh, almost to zero. We'll get into a vacuum. And about 135 seconds into flight, we reach a point at which there just isn't enough air to accelerate a small piece of foam to the kind of energy that can cause damage. Um, you know, it, it, it depends on a lot of parameters, but that's the basic thing. The air just gets too thin after about 2 minutes and 15 seconds for us to worry about impact damage from foam releases uh, off the external tank. All right, let's try this side of the room. Anybody over here? 
All right, we'll go back to the other side of the room. Let's go. Oh, there's Jay. Let's go to the second. Come around here to the uh, second row, Jay Barbary, the dean of reporters. Boo yourself. <laughs> so, that's right. I'm Boo yourself, I would. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, going back, Wayne, if you will, 135 seconds, you start getting too thin going into vacuum. You're not concern concerned about it. Before you get, how, how fast do you have to be going before you get concerned about it from liftoff? And also, Mike, uh, you okay for the 28th now for Atlantis? <sighs> First part of the question, I have to go back and look. I'm I'm not uh, coming up, but we get going pretty fast, pretty quick. 60 seconds. 60, 60 seconds roughly. Um, before that, you're not going fast enough to uh, to really have a, so have a speed. A of about a minute, 15 and roughly a minute and a quarter that you really have to worry about. And not all that window is created equal. Yeah. August 28th. August. All right, and then August 28th, Mike? Yeah, sure. Um, August 28th looks really good for Atlantis. In fact, we'll mate the external tank to uh, those solid rocket boosters day after tomorrow. So everything's on schedule with Atlantis's mission the end of August. We're looking good. All right, uh, stay down the row. Uh, further down to Guy in the green shirt. Guy Gugliotta of the Washington Post. Um, I guess uh, probably for Wayne or John, can you tell us anything about the uh, stresses to the orbiter because of the lack of PAL ramps as yet? Well, I, hey. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> in a word? Yeah, play it worked just fine. I, and, and that's, of course, that's one thing they'll look at in the, um, in the engineering analysis is they'll take a look from the video that was sitting right on top of that LOX feed line, and uh, if you remember, we have some accelerometers that are on those cable trays, and uh, when we get the uh, solid rocket boosters back, we'll get the engineering data from that, and from there, we hope to be able to, to um, correlate the models that we had developed to say that it was okay. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting that data back on about flight day four, and we'll let the engineers go to work. All right, next question. Stay right there with Coach Randy. Randy Avera with Randolph Publishing for Mike Griffin. Today has been a successful launch, and uh, certainly this mission is about the future of science for NASA and its international partners. Could you give us your thoughts, Mike, on the, uh, uh, the public? How would the public uh, connect with NASA to find out and follow along with what NASA is doing and the new science that's being done? And your thoughts about the science that's going to be done on the International Space Station uh, from now to the end of the shuttle program, your thoughts on those items? Well, you can stay up with what's going on on NASA most easily probably just by dialing up our website. Uh, for those who like to surf the Internet, that's probably the, the easiest way to keep track of what we do. Um, for uh, the science to be done on space station over the next few years, I've, I've uh, uh, I, I've been frank in the past to say, of course, right now we're in a maintenance mode. We've got two crew on the station, and we're adding a third one with uh, this flight. Before we can really get uh, the kind of work done on space station that we built it to do, we have to get the science labs up, and they come along relatively late in the sequence. Uh, our focus for the next few years is in assembling the station. And... Uh, once we get it put together and completed by 2010, we'll then focus on using it. Um, our earlier plan uh, had uh, had the intention of having a lot of a good a good deal of space station utilization uh, going on while we assembled it. We've eliminated most of those utilization flights, and uh, we have fewer shuttle flights than we once planned to have. And so, our focus for the next few years is pretty strictly on assembly. Get it built, then we can use it. All right, next question, go to the front row right here, Mike Schneider. Hi, Mike Schneider, Associated Press. Now that the shuttle's up in orbit, um, can you, are you optimistic that you'll get that extra day uh, and the third spacewalk? And then uh, a, a debris question for Wayne. It looked like uh, within about 10 seconds um, of, of the launch, uh, something fell from uh, the shuttle. It looked like it might have been butcher paper or something like that, but do you know what, what that might be? Okay, sure. Uh, since he wouldn't take any debris questions, I'd be happy to. <laughs> the, uh, uh, was the, last one. the first one was, uh, the question was, do we expect to get that 13th day? And because uh, Mike 
Linebox team uh, reloaded the cryogenics for the fuel cells. We do expect to get the 13th day. Of course, we'll we'll watch it on orbit, and the uh, I think the flight control team's uh, time to make that call will be about flight day seven. And if we do get that 13th day, it would add a third EVA. Um, I don't know specifically what you might have seen, but the timing, uh, 10 seconds off the pad, the timing would be consistent with the, the covers that we put over the reaction control jets in the forward. They have little parachutes on them to peel off at an early time so they don't become a debris problem. So I, I don't know specifically, but if I had to guess it, it, what you were seeing, that would be it. All right, next question. Let's come back over here, uh, second row. Sorry to get you up and moving. <laughs> Our third row. And anyone else who feels strongly about it. You had a weekend of frustrating weather delays, a long day yesterday with a foam issue. Um, what sort of sense did you have emotionally when you saw a safe launch today? Was there relief? What, what were you feeling when, when it got up there safely? I wouldn't know how to answer that. Um, I was... Uh, watching data, looking at the flight performance, um, I'm not aware of what feelings I had. I wouldn't even say the weekend was particularly frustrating. Um, this is a business where in the summertime out of Florida, I, I guess having been down here an awful lot of time for a lot of different kinds of launches, if you get one day out of three in the summer where you can launch, that ain't bad. So. Uh, we tried three times and we got off. I'd say it met my expectations. All right, right up front, one row up. Shuish Date with the Palm Beach Post. I guess for Mike, um, I assume that the August date is also a daytime launch. And if so, how many more flights do you plan on doing with these ice frost ramps before you move to something else, maybe without them or, or some other implement or device? Yeah, the, uh, the launch time for the next mission is an afternoon launch, much like today's was. I don't have the exact time for you yet. That's going to depend on a lot of factors, of course. But it will be a lit uh, launch in the afternoon, much like today. Uh, let's see. I guess I can take the next part. Uh, I was talking with Steve Cash, who is the uh, chairman of our Tiger team that's working on redesigning the ice frost ramps. Um, they are hopeful to uh, provide a little bit more testing over the next week and come with their proposed solution to us at the end of next week. Um, we are probably looking at the fourth, what, I would, what you would call the fourth tank to implement that on. Of course, we're going to, uh, at the, the tank that we just launched being the first, the one in August the second, one in December the third. So we would be looking at the fourth tank probably to implement those changes on. Okay, to follow up on that then, can we expect to have another orbiter on a standby basis for all of these until you change over to that other tank? Um, yes. All right, next question, let's... Go right here in the second row. Curtis Kruger, St. Petersburg Times, for Mr. Griffin or Mr. Hale. Uh, is this flight uh, a transition flight that gets you into that, out of the return to flight mode and into the more rapid uh, building the space station mode? Uh, yes, and, and that's the comment that you know I made the other day, is that this flight, of course, is important for station. We're bringing up oxygen generating equipment and, and, and other provisions. Um, so we had operational goals, but a major portion of this flight was to gather the return to flight data that we needed. And you, you heard Gerst and, and Wayne commenting earlier about the value of the, the data that we think we're going to get. Um, with that, uh, it's our, you know, and then assuming that we see good things in the footage as we expect based on what we've seen so far. Uh, assuming that, it's now time to pick up a normal ops tempo for the program and, and get about our business. And, and I've been saying for some time that's our real goal here. So, yes. All right, let's go to the other side of the room, second row. Uh, Brent Nelson with Newsday. I'm just wondering if you have any remaining concerns about the left aft thruster issue in terms of the uh, maneuvering of the, the shuttle before docking with the space station? Yeah, I'll take that. The uh, the uh, flight control team in mission control in Houston uh, briefed the mission management team on their plan. And it's exactly what I told you, I think it was uh, two days ago, maybe yesterday. Um, they're going to fly, the orbiter will fly just fine with uh, five of those six small thrusters. And they have a plan to recover the sixth for rendezvous. 
Um, so it's it's pretty much a nominal uh, normal plan for the uh, the astronauts on board. If for some reason they were not able to regain that sixth thruster, they have a backup uh, digital autopilot mode that the crew is practiced with that would let them accomplish rendezvous and docking. So no real change to the plan. All right, let's uh, go to the back row. Alan Boyle with MSNBC, probably for Mike Leinbach, on the birds, the vultures. Was there any update on what happened to them? Had to be one. Can't, can't, can't get away from them. Um, we executed our plan for the birds perfectly today. <laughs> There's your quote. We didn't execute any birds. <laughs> there, there were no birds over the vehicle at, at launch time. We, we had a plan in place to, to protect for that. And Pete Nikolenko, the chief NASA test director, and I were in contact from nine minutes on down, just as we laid out. And, and there were no birds over the vehicle. All right, stay in the last row, a couple over, over here to the, to the right, in the middle. There you go. Nell Boyce with National Public Radio. Um, this may seem like a strange question, but I'm not really sure where you all are when you're watching the launch. I mean, can you see the launch with your very own eyes outside and hear the great sound and everything, or are you watching it on monitors? And if the administrator was not aware of his feelings during the launch, were any of you aware of your feelings, and could you share them with us? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I could see the. <laughs> um, well, Mike, of course, is is in the top center, and he has a very nice view. And and I'm in the in the room right next to him with the mission management team. And I, I tried to split my view between watching the shuttle go up and and the uh, incredible external tank camera photos that we were seeing. I, it just, it just, it just blows me away. I, the tears were in my eyes as I watched watched it going. Um, as far as I, I did have some feelings at, at launch, and and what I had told the guys though is that this is kind of the starting gun for us. It it seems like a long road to get to launch, but um, I'm going to fly back to Houston in half an hour, and we're going to start our first mission management team meeting tomorrow at at one o'clock, and that'll go throughout. And uh, we have a very uh, aggressive flight in front of us. Uh, three uh, EVAs. We're gonna we're gonna get on the boom and make sure that that we can use that as a repair platform. We're going to change out a, a critical piece of equipment on the station that if we're not successful changing it out, we can't fly the next mission. Uh, we're going to test our, our uh, wing leading edge repair capabilities. Um, we're going to move the, the multi-purpose logistics module to the station, unload it, load it up with stuff we don't want. We're going to put a, uh, a spare pump module, which is bigger than this table here, on, on the station as a spare. Um, so it is a, we have a very aggressive flight, you know. And then late on top of that, we have our, the normal inspection stuff that we, we had planned. And uh, I am just, I am looking so forward to this. And uh, it, it, this, this mission has been on the books for about, about two years. We have a team that has really planned it out, and we are ready to hit the ground running tomorrow. All right, uh, next question. Let's stay right there in front of you with Tarek. Thank you. Uh, Tarek Malik with Space.com and Space News. Um, I think for, for Mike, uh, they'd mentioned, I guess, once you know, once the, the orbiter had reached, uh, you know, I guess, a pretty good height, that there wasn't a slight instrumentation glitch that it was relatively minor. I was kind of curious what what that was and how that affected anything. And um, also, I guess, on, on the lighter side, do the astronauts get time and a half today because it's a holiday? Or <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the glitch going uphill was um, uh, just after SRB staging. We fire the the small orbital maneuvering system engines. And uh, we got a, a message for an accumulator quantity, which is just kind of the pressurization system for that. It had just barely tripped a limit, and uh, it was not indicative of any problem at all. Time and a half question. Anybody want to take know. that one? <laughs> right after we get time and a half, they'll get time and a half. <laughs> Bring it on. I wouldn't be holding your breath. <laughs> Fair enough. There goes my case. All right, I let's go. I think they do it for free, tell you the truth. <laughs> Let's go further down the line right here on, uh, on the wall. The woman in red. Liz Hurley, WAFF Huntsville. My question is for Wayne. Well, you've talked to your Tiger team at the Marshall Space Flight Center. They're working on that redesign of the ice frost ramps. Tell me, you've knocked off 37 pounds of foam. You've done away with the power ramps. How drastic so far does this redesign look? Well, they're looking at three different options, and, and they are – drastic in the sense that they'd cut back on the amount of foam that we use in the area around those brackets quite a bit. 
Um, there's different amounts. They, they have to keep enough insulation around the brackets to make sure they don't form ice because that would be worse. Um, and at the same time, we want to minimize the amount of soft foam insulation that could come off um, due to some of the problems that we've seen. So um, they have, they're still in the lab. They are in there today back in Huntsville working in the environmental chambers, putting, uh, putting the different options through some tests to, so that we can come to a good conclusion and have a good option to then take to the wind tunnel, put in the wind tunnel and make sure it holds together. So uh, it's, it's going to be a pretty different design when they're all said and done. All right, let's come back on this side, front row. Uh, Stefan Aquila down for Time Magazine. Uh, the cooling of the main engines, uh, that issue that came up uh, during the count, could you explain that uh, a little bit and also say how, I mean, how many degrees uh, the, the temperature differential was? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. That's a that's a situation we practice quite often in our in our training runs, and it has to do with a particular temperature measurement inside the main engines. They have to be within a certain band of temperature to get a proper start. Can't be too warm, can't be too cold. And after the two scrubs, we noticed a, a slight trend on one of the engines that that may have warmed up a bit too much for us. Didn't happen today. Uh, so what we were doing in the control room was taking steps to prepare for the workaround had it occurred, which it did not. And so the temperature was right in the band that had to be. Uh, it was a purely a contingency plan that we practiced a lot and, and uh, just wanted to talk through one more time today in case it really happened to us late in the count. All right, anybody that hasn't been able to ask a question, let's go over there right there with John. Uh, John Schwartz, New York Times for uh, Dr. Griffin. Um, a couple of days ago when you were asked whether if it was a successful launch you would feel vindicated, you responded, certainly not and talked about what engineers do and how they do it. Uh, just wanted to know if you wanted to revise your opinion uh, at this point in light of the launch and whether any other, uh, any other senses crept into this that you wanted to talk about. No. Uh, the decision that we made um, was obvious on the numbers, and that's why we made it the way we made it. Um, it was a long time getting there. It was a difficult piece of analysis to do extremely complex, utilizing the skills of a, of a wide variety of different discipline engineers, and uh, it took us a long time to make sure, as sure as we could, that we hadn't missed anything really crucial. With all that on the table, the decision really made itself. Uh, I certainly don't feel it as any sense of, of personal vindication, or it's, it's a vindication for the scientific method, if anything. We, we followed the data and we went where it took us. Um, you know, we keep coming back to feelings. You know, I'll have time for feelings after I'm dead. <laughs> right, right now we're busy. I don't know how you follow that one. Okay, um, let's go right here, uh, second row. You haven't had a chance to ask a question. Hi, uh, Dan Glass, Seed Magazine. Um, I know the focus of this mission is um, uh, repair and maintenance. And I'm wondering, what's the most serious contingency that you would find out about on the ground that you were prepared to deal with once you were already up? I, I, don't, I, I don't think it's a hypothetical question. question. Yeah. I, you know, there's, what a, I, there's a make or break. There must be a line where you're like, we're willing to deal up until this point when we find out on the ground. And after I, that. I, what I tell you is that we have put the capability in place to completely inspect the orbiter and understand its condition. We have some. Um, some basic uh, repair capabilities that, that we could go put in place if required, and um, uh, you know we it would just be a very situational condition. All right, who hasn't had a, a chance to ask a question yet? All right, let's go back over there in the fourth row, I guess. Yes. Uh, Andy Matag, Fuji Television. This is a very different type of question, so please indulge me. Um, at approx uh, there have been reports that at approximately the same time that the shuttle was launched. North Korea launched missiles, uh, test-fired test missiles towards Japan. I wonder if any of you had heard anything about that and whether you have any thoughts about North Korea perhaps wanting to be competitive with NASA. Is that I heard about it. Uh, this is a NASA press conference on today's shuttle launch, and we have no other comment on that topic. All right, next question. Who hasn't had a chance? Here we go uh, in the fourth row. Sorry to run you around. Thank you. 
Jackie Goddard for the Times of London. A question for Mr. Shannon, I think. I'm just a little confused about what it is precisely that determines the 13th day. I think it's consumables, but could you just elaborate on that? And is there certain sort of rationing on board that the astronauts try and make in order to save consumables for that 13th day? Sure. It's, it's very straightforward. Uh, we have fuel cells that produce electricity. They run on hydrogen and oxygen. And uh, what we did yesterday is we loaded up the hydrogen full so that given the normal mission profile usage of electricity, that we would have that 13th day. So it's just basically having enough hydrogen and oxygen to get that extra time on orbit. All right, uh, next question. Anybody that wants to ask a question that hasn't had an opportunity to ask? All right, oh, we'll go one more question here. Yeah, this is Shreesh Dante with the Post again. Uh, now that it's launched, now can we have the FRR material or? or? No. <laughs> All right, uh, any other questions? All right, we're going to go to some closing remarks, and we'll wrap up the press conference. Uh, Mike, anything? All right, <clears throat> Gerst? I guess the only thing I'd, I'd say is when I watch the launch, I've had the privilege of going around the country and spending time with the workers that helped put this vehicle together. And, and I think about those folks. I think about that external tank that we saw out on the launch pad. You know, that's truly a miracle we saw sitting out there on the launch pad. If you think about the circumstances when that tank was put together in New Orleans, our workforce that had no homes, that put their lives essentially on hold, their personal lives, and dedicated themselves to working on that tank, that's phenomenal. I think about the workers in the OPF that tirelessly changed all those gap fillers, that had unbelievable patience to pull those out and put them in every day and put them in and then still smile about it and laugh with me when I talk to them about it. Another one failed and we got to put it back in again. What an awesome attitude that is. I think about yesterday with this team that came up with this idea to take a flexible piece of hose with a boroscope camera on the end that gave us an inspection technique that saved us a day that allowed this beautiful launch today. They did that on their own. They thought of that on their own. What an amazing team. I think about the Italian uh, module, the MPLM that sits in there that was built in Alinea in Torino, Spain, uh, Torino Italy. I, I got a call from the Russians immediately after launch. Uh, both uh, Mr. Permenov and um, Alexei Krasnov, my counterpart, called me and congratulated me on the launch. I mean, what an awesome team this is. I, this is the best of the best coming together to do a truly beautiful thing. I'm not going to top that. <laughs> no. Well said. All right. Uh, I think that's going to wrap us up. Uh, that's going to wrap up today's STS-121 post-launch uh, news briefing. Again, Wayne and uh, we'll be coming up, I guess, Wayne and his team, but it's just Wayne. It'll be the Wayne Show uh, at 730. So we look forward to that. For more information, please go, start, go to our website, www.nasa.gov. Have a great Fourth of July and a, a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Wayne's a team all by himself. <laughs> that, I may need to find somebody to bring along. <laughs>
This is Mission Control Houston at a mission elapsed time of two hours into the flight of Discovery. Two hours since the shuttle and its seven astronauts lifted off from the Kennedy Space Center on time at 1.38 p.m. Central Time. While the post-launch news conference was underway at the Kennedy Space Center, mission specialists Mike Fossum and Lisa Nowak opened up the shuttle's payload bay doors. That procedure went uh, by the book. No issues associated with the opening of the payload bay doors. Okay, and block 11 is complete. Block 12 in work. We copy. Thank you. And the ASN flight director, Steve Stitch, who presided over his first launch today with the assistance of weather flight director Norm Knight, uh, gave the crew a go for on-orbit operations after a poll of the flight control room here at Mission Control. At this moment, uh, the ASN team is currently handing over to the Orbit 2 team of flight controllers. Uh, from right to left on your screen uh, is the Orbit 2 uh, flight director for this evening, Kelly Beck. Norm Knight, who was the weather flight director today, will be the Orbit 2 flight director uh, for the uh, majority of the rest of the mission uh, for the STS-121 mission of Discovery. Steve Stitch, the ASN flight director, is to her right, the second from the right on your screen. Steve Frick, second from the left, uh, the spacecraft communicator who has been uh, walking through the post-insertion procedures with Commander Steve Lindsay and his crew on, on orbit. And on the far left of your screen is astronaut Lee Archambault, who will be the spacecraft communicator throughout this flight for the Orbit 2 team, which basically uh, will take uh, control of the second half of the crew's workday each day of this STS-121 mission. At this hour, Discovery and its uh, crew of seven astronauts, pilot Mark Kelly, flight engineer Lisa Nowak, Mike Fossum, Stephanie Wilson, Pierce Sellers, and European Space Agency astronaut Tomas Reiner, who's en route for a half year in space aboard the International Space Station, are uh, unloading equipment. They're currently setting up computers and preparing for the downlink about two hours from now of uh, the imagery that was collected uh, by the umbilical well cameras uh, aboard Discovery, as well as the handheld photography, uh, both digital stills and um, video that were shot uh, by Mike Fossum and Stephanie Wilson about 11 minutes after launch, about three minutes after main engine cutoff, as they were at a distance of about 1,450 feet away from the shuttle's external tank following its uh, separation from the shuttle after main engine cutoff. Again, uh, the crew on board Discovery setting up shop uh, for their 12-day uh, mission, which could be expanded to a 13-day mission, pending approval of an extension day for this flight that will be considered uh, by the mission management team a couple of days from now. Down the hall from uh, the Space Shuttle Flight Control Room and the International Space Station Flight Control Room, another team of flight controllers on duty as they are 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, presiding over the crew on board the complex. Throughout the course of the day today, uh, the Orbit uh, 2 team of flight controllers in the ISS Flight Control Room has been presided over by Flight Director John Curry. Uh, Curry uh, remains on console at this hour with his spacecraft communicator, Mike Jensen. Uh, that team uh, it will be handing off to another team of uh, flight controllers a short, a short time from now. And then the uh, team of International Space Station flight controllers who will actually take over the active execution of this STS-121 mission from the station perspective, led by the lead station flight director, Rick LeBrode, will be on console beginning tomorrow morning. Activation complete. We copy. Thank you. And as you can see here in this uh, view, uh, Mark Ferring, uh, who was the lead uh, station flight director a year ago for the shuttle's return to flight mission on STS-114, has taken over for uh, John Curry. Ferring will be on console uh, for the next uh, eight and a half hours or so as uh, this team of flight controllers puts the Expedition 13 crew to bed. Commander Pavel Vinogradov and flight engineer and NASA science officer Jeff Williams, who actually were able to watch the launch of Discovery through the courtesy of a video uplink. Uh, at the time of Discovery's launch, there was a KU band communications capability with the station, and uh, Williams and Vinogradov uh, were afforded the opportunity to watch Discovery's launch and climb to orbit on a video uplink uh, provided to the International Space Station. At this hour, Discovery uh, is currently 
orbiting over the heart of uh, Central Africa, moving from northwest to southeast in an orbit uh, inclined 51.6 degrees to either side of the equator. Discovery in pursuit of the International Space Station, which at the moment is approaching the west coast of Mexico. Docking of Discovery to the International Space Station scheduled Thursday morning at 9.52 a.m. Central Time. Again, uh, Discovery's payload bay doors are open. The crew has been given a go for on-orbit operations. All of Discovery's systems in excellent shape. And Houston, Block 14 is complete. We copy Block 14 complete. And uh, looking uh, ahead at the next page, uh, Steve, we have some deltas for you before config for Vernier Control. So anytime before you get to that block, just give me a call. Okay, copy that. And he's an AP steam at heater activation and work. We copy. Houston, I'm ready to copy the deltas for the config for run air control. Okay, Steve, uh, the short story is we're going to deselect L5L and then go to Vern's. Uh, the longer story is uh, before you work config for Vern control, uh, we'll just like uh, on spec 23, the left page, and item 37 to deselect L5L. You can expect to get a DAP reconfig message uh, when you make that deselection. Uh, that's expected and no impact. Uh, just below that, when you go to A-Auto Vern, you can expect to get another DAP reconfig message. You can expect to have the DAP kick back to free and also get a fail leak indication on L5L. That's all expected, and you can just hit Vern's again, and it should go to Vern's. Okay, I'm going to put that in work now. I'm going to go to the left page. I'm going to do an item 37 to deselect L5L, and then I'll uh, bring the driver on, wait five seconds, A-Auto Vern. When I get that, I expect a uh, DAP free message and a fail leak message, as well as getting a message when I deselect the jet, and then I just select Vern again. It should be fine. At Discover Houston, that's a good read back. Just to uh, correct something I read up wrong, uh, you'll have to select Auto Vern again to have it uh, kick in on the second try. Okay, copy that.
Discovery Houston. Thanks for that, Steve. We like your DAP config. This is Mission Control Houston, two hours, 14 minutes into the flight of Discovery. Here in the flight control room, the space shuttle flight control room, the ASCEN team of flight controllers uh, is completing its handover to the Orbit 2 team. We're looking for deltas right now. We only have one delta to page 1-19. Uh, it's your uh, L1 schematic. Just let me know when you're there. Uh, Steve, the only delta uh, related to the high load issue we were looking at was we'd like you to leave the high load duct heater in alpha. Do not take it off. Okay, copy. Well, I'll keep the high load duct heater in alpha. That's a good readback. Once again, uh, handover now being completed between the ASCEN team of flight controllers 
and the Orbit 2 team of flight controllers that will preside over the rest of the crew's workday, putting the crew to bed. Just before 8 p.m. Central Time, the crew due to be awakened just before 4 a.m. Central Time on Wednesday to begin its first full day in orbit. Everything on board Discovery very clean. The payload bay doors have been open. The crew has been given a go for on-orbit operations. The KU band communications antenna providing downlink high data rate telemetry and television uh, from Discovery has been deployed and is in good shape. And the crew continues to work uh, toward uh, its timeline that will include uh, the uh, downlinking of umbilical well imagery as well as handheld imagery of the shuttle's external tank that was captured shortly after the external fuel tank was jettisoned after main engine cutoff. Tomorrow's work plan for the crew will primarily focus on preparations for Thursday's docking to the International Space Station that is scheduled just before 10 a.m. Central Time, as well as the, the first inspection of the shuttle's uh, heat protective thermal protection system. The uh, shuttle's robotic arm will uh, be unfurled and tested. It then will grapple the uh, orbiter boom sensor system that is a 50-foot extension to the shuttle's robotic arm to form a 100-foot long robotic arm equipped with sensors and television cameras. The uh, orbiter boom sensor system will be used uh, to scan the starboard wing of Discovery, its nose cap, and the port wing as well as the upper surfaces of the orbiter in the first full-up inspection of the shuttle's heat shield following its launch from the Kennedy Space Center today. Once again, a docking of Discovery to the International Space Station is scheduled for 9.52 a.m. Central Time on Thursday. The uh, shuttle will be delivering more than two tons of cargo to the crew on board the International Space Station, that cargo currently contained in the Leonardo Multipurpose Logistics Module. Also uh, on tap during at least eight and probably nine days of docked operations between the two crews will be the replacement of the trailing umbilical system reel assembly uh, for the mobile transporter, the rail car that moves up and down the truss system of the International Space Station. That uh, replacement uh, of that uh, trailing umbilical system required to put the rail car back in operation so it can be used on the next shuttle mission, STS-115, the flight of Atlantis, now planned for late August to install the P-3 or Port-3, Port-4 truss structure uh, to continue the buildup of the power system on the International Space Station. Discover Houston, uh, we'll talk about why it was already in, but we do like the config of it being in. And uh, while I have you, Steve, I've got a few uh, just tag-up items from uh, the flight up to this point. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, the first thing was uh, related to the, the pre-launch uh, discussion about the brightness on CRT-1. I just wanted to make sure that uh, you were comfortable with the, uh, the reason we were doing that. It was strictly an LCC uh, concern. We do not think there's going to be any problem with the brightness on that CRT during the mission. And we don't think you're getting any messages either. We may get some, some downlisted uh, bites if that reoccurs, but you shouldn't see any, any uh, issues with it, and it should work fine for the whole mission. Yeah, I copied that. That was kind of the conclusion I had before we launched. Okay, uh, also I have uh, just a very preliminary uh, debris report, uh, if you're ready. Go ahead. Uh, Steve, all we have uh, from the initial video review to this point was just uh, two events. Uh, both were late enough that they were noticeably past the, uh, the area of, of concern with higher, higher cues. First one was at about uh, 2 minutes and 50 seconds. They saw some pieces, maybe about five, uh, that came off of uh, near the LO2 feed line area. They don't know if they're uh, ice frost ramps or not. Uh, they noted some of them near the fuselage, but they didn't see any of them contact or see any damage. Uh, also, just to note, it was at about 240,000 feet, and the PSF, the Q was all the way down to about 1.5 uh, PSF. Okay, copy that. Uh, the, uh, the only other item they noticed was uh, noticeably later, about four, almost five minutes, about 4.45. Uh, 
they saw a piece come off of uh, the mid part of the tank, uh, not sure if it's acreage or, or closer to the feed line, and it did seem to strike the mid body uh, somewhere about halfway between the main landing gear and the nose landing gear door. Uh, we'll, of course, look at it on the RPM photos, but it, the PSF there was about zero. You were way up at 350,000 feet, so that should not be a concern. Copy that, uh, and uh, copy that, and we'll take a look at that. And uh, we, I want to hand the mic over to Mike to talk to you about what he saw uh, when during the ET photo. Okay. Yeah, Steve, Mike with you. Uh, when we were looking out the overheads, I had the uh, PD-100 video. Uh, we saw what really appeared to be some cloth, uh, probably some of the frizzy or dense frizzy. Uh, that's pure speculation on my part, but it, it seemed to be a stitched type material uh, at least four to five feet long, perhaps as much as six to eight. Uh, couldn't really guess at the distance away from us. It was sort of tumbling and twisting. Uh, it was kind of a combination of straps with a little bit of squarish material, which is why it really looked a lot like the uh, uh, the frizzy insulation. Uh, we did get at least some video, uh, at least got some video of it, and uh, toward the end we made an attempt to get some stills. Uh, we'll, of course, get, con get the uh, DTV configured for uh, downlink uh, uh, expeditiously. Okay, uh, we copy all. We'll look forward to that uh, video and photos coming down whenever uh, whenever you're able. And uh, just so we're uh, just so we make sure we understand, this was during the ET photo evolution. Doors were closed, and you just saw it floating away from the vehicle. And that's affirmative. Uh, it was after we did the pitch over. We were actually, you know, in the midst of taking the uh, ET photo, and. Uh, I, I don't have an exact time, but it was uh, probably at uh, MET of about 15 minutes or so. I noticed uh, some of this this material floating in my field of view, so it was uh, it was like between us and the tank. Uh, just going off of the first memory, uh, the range was probably about uh, 40 yards or so, 40 about 40 yards uh, when I first saw it between us and the tank. Okay, we copy all. Thanks very much for the description. And understand uh, it looked like it was four to five feet long, maybe six to eight feet long. It had some straps to it. Uh, it really looked like stitch material to you. And understand it was kind of a long and thin piece. Is that right? Uh, that's affirmative. Actually, there was some kind of it, kind of a, a real flat T. There was some strap, uh, you know, coming off at uh, at uh, right angles to the main strap too. Okay, we copy all. Mike, we really appreciate that description, and we'll, of course, look forward to uh, the video and the, and the photos coming down, and we'll get information back to you when we get that as soon as we know it. Uh, Roger that. This is one of those times when the uh, picture's worth uh, thousands and thousands of words, so we'll uh, quit talking for now and try to get that down to you fast. Okay, we copy all, and... Uh, for Steve and the whole crew, mentioned for Ascent with the Ascent imagery uh, through the night, and we'll we'll get you more and more detailed summaries later. Uh, also, before I uh, uh, sign off here and send you back to post insertion, I was just curious if you had any window reports. All right, we copy. Thanks. And uh, if you see anything uh, later on during post insertion tonight or tomorrow, just uh, just let us know. Will do.
This is Mission Control Houston. Two hours, 26 minutes into the flight of Discovery. Again, uh, Mission Specialist Mike Fossum aboard uh, the orbiter as it travels over the southern Indian Ocean, about to begin a southwest to northeasterly swing across the Pacific Ocean. Fossum uh, providing a uh, visual report on uh, what he believed to be uh, some uh, insulation uh, that may have uh, floated away from the orbiter. However, uh, the school of thought here uh, suggests that it might have been ice uh, from some of the structure on the orbiter that may have floated away. In any event, the imagery analysts busy at work now here at the Johnson Space Center, uh, beginning to pour over the initial imagery uh, that has uh, come down and will continue to come down in the days ahead. Uh, at the Kennedy Space Center, two and a half hours from now at 6.30 p.m. Central Time, 7.30 Eastern Time, Space Shuttle Program Manager Wayne Hill will be holding an imagery quick look briefing uh, to discuss uh, his analysis and what he has heard from the imagery experts over the course of the first few hours of Discovery's mission. Again, the STS-121 imagery quick look briefing featuring Space Shuttle Program Manager Wayne Hill set uh, for 6.30 p.m. Central Time, 7.30 Eastern Time tonight from the Kennedy Space Center. All of Discovery systems in excellent shape. The Ascent team has now handed over to the Orbit 2 team that will preside over the remainder of the crew's workday and put the crew to sleep as they begin their pursuit of the International Space Station and a docking just before 10 a.m. Central Time on Thursday. All of Discovery systems are in excellent condition. Stephanie and Mike, newest astronauts on the crew, we enjoyed watching your work on Ascent and we're looking forward to watching your work for the rest of the mission. Thank you very much, Steve. It was a pleasure to work with you guys. Looking forward to seeing you again uh, around entry time, and uh, and uh, we enjoyed it. And one more question for you, Steve. Go ahead. Uh, do you know uh, how Germany did in the World Cup? The game's still going on. It started as soon as it's over. The interest on board Discovery expressed by Commander Steve Lindsay, no doubt expressed uh, by their temporary crewmate, Tomas Ryder of the European Space Agency, who on Thursday will uh, become a part of the Expedition 13 crew, returning the International Space Station to a three-man crew for the first time since May of 2003. With all of Discovery systems in good shape, setting out on at least a 12 and perhaps 13-day mission, we pass the two-hour, 29-minute mark into the flight of Discovery on the STS-121 mission. This is Mission Control Houston. Discovery Houston copies, thanks.